If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you turn with me to uh, the book of 2 Corinthians again. Uh, looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm just going to move that. Um, I'm going to be reading verses 12 to 18 for us. Second Corinthians chapter uh, 3, not chapter 12, chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 12. I got to move further away from it. I forgot my glasses. Uh, all right. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end uh, of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. God bless the reading of His Word. Uh, stories told of a woman who testified to the transformation in her life that had resulted from becoming a Christian. She declared, I am so glad I became a Christian. I have an uncle I used to hate so much. I vowed I'd never go to his funeral. But now that I'm a Christian, why, I'd be happy to go to his funeral anytime. Uh, One Sunday on their way home from church, a little girl turned to her mother and said, Mommy, the preacher's sermon this morning confused me. And mom said, Oh, why is that? And the little girl replied, Well, he said that God is bigger than we are. Is that true? And the mother replied, Yes, that's true, honey. And, And he also said that God lives in us. Is that true, Mommy? And again, the mother replied, Yes. Well said the little girl, if God is bigger than us and he lives in us, wouldn't he show through? Um, as Paul continues his second letter to the Corinthian church, he, he takes a look back at a story that is found in the Old Testament in Exodus. It's found in Exodus chapter 34. Let, let me just read this excerpt for you. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant, excuse me, because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Uh, Exodus 34, 29 to 35. Uh, Moses was in the presence of God when he was given the law on Mount Sinai. The glory of God was so great that when he returned to the Israelites, his face reflected the glory of God. After speaking with the Israelites, Moses covered his face with a veil 
so they would not see God's glory fading. Paul shares this story to mean that what God had done with Moses was fading away, just like the glow would fade from Moses' face. Paul wrote that this veil clouds their minds when the law is read. And what's worse is that the veil covers their hearts. The glory was fading because Christ had come to fulfill the law and bring a more permanent solution uh, to not only the Israelites, but to the whole world. It was through the sending of His Son and then the Holy Spirit that would truly have the power to transform. When we're legalistic, depending on our efforts to achieve righteousness, we intentionally block our hearts and minds from the glory of God's grace. The law brought death. The reflection of God's glory faded. There was a veil there. What does this veil look like today? There's a lot of spiritual people that, that live out there that, that are wearing a veil over their hearts. They're trapped by their own attitudes and can't see what Jesus offers them. Some think that by changing their behaviors, they, they hope that their hearts and desires will change too. Uh, from 1996 through 2001, Robert Downey Jr. was arrested numerous times on drug-related charges, including uh, cocaine, heroin, and, and marijuana, and went several times through drug treatment programs unsuccessfully. He explained his relapses by claiming to have been addicted to drugs since the age of eight, uh, due to the fact that his father was also an addict. Uh, he'd been giving them to him. After five years of substance abuse, arrest, rehab, and relapse, Robert Downey Jr. was finally ready to work toward a full recovery from drugs and a return to his career. In discussing his failed attempts to control his own addictive behavior in the past, Downey had told Oprah Winfrey in, in November 2004, when someone says, I really wonder if maybe I should go to rehab, well, uh, you're a wreck. You lost your job and your wife left you. Um, you might want to give it a shot. He added that after his last arrest in April 2001, when he knew he would likely be facing another stint in prison or another form of incarceration such as court-ordered rehab, I finally said, you know what? I don't think I can continue doing this. And I reached out for help and I, I ran with it. Now, Robert Downey Jr. is not a Christian. But when we try to do it on our own by following our own plan, change does not come because it's not just about recognizing the wrong. Setting up guards in our lives to protect us is not a bad thing, but doing something externally with the hope that it changes something internally is not the answer. We also need to give it over to God and allow Him to help us overcome. Then and only then, transformation can come. Those who wear a veil, thinking, uh, who also wear a veil, thinking every highway leads to God. They think that all religions have the same goal in mind. That they all believe in love of fellow man and promoting the goodness of humanity. Pastor Lane Davis wrote, All religions may be wrong, but they certainly cannot all be right. Every religion differs vastly on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. And as such, the law of non-contradiction rules out the truth claims that all paths lead to God and that all religions are the same. Simply because each religion offers conflicting and exclusive truth claims as to what the path is. 
there are some similarities uh, between most religions in the ethical truth claims. Loving neighbor, loving, loving others as you love yourself, things like that. But that's where the similarities end. They all have some exclusivity to their paths to God. And most of it is in the things that you have to do to find and walk the path to God. Pretty well, every other religion claims that by following certain steps, it will lead to salvation. Again, transformation will only come by following a set of behaviors. But that does not bring fulfillment. Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus did not come to tell us about God like Muhammad or Buddha. Jesus came as God. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God, but the, o- but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Another veil that exists is the idea that all I have to do to be, is to be good, and I should be okay. You know what? If there's a heaven, I feel like I'll get in because I've been a good person. I never murdered anybody. I never stole anything. I lied once in a while because I had to. But I, but I love my wife and I loved my children. I've been good. Well, the problem with that veil is by what standard of goodness do you measure yourself? How do you know you're good? Paul wrote to the Roman church a portion of the Psalms. As it's written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Romans 3, 10 to 12. There's no human standard of goodness by which we can measure ourselves. You know, we are all imperfect in some area of our lives. You know, Malcolm X, well, he was a bit, he was good, but not really. Martin Luther King, great, great preacher, but I'm sure there were things in his life that weren't perfect. Uh, Buddha, no. He had some good things to say. I don't know what his lifestyle was like. Uh, there, there's, just, there's no perfect human standard by which we can follow and say, you know what, if you're doing that, you're good. <laughs> Paul, though, gives us the answer to this dilemma a few verses later. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness or goodness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 21 to 24. So Paul is saying that we know there's no human standard to live by. So if we, if we realize and understand that God is the standard, then we really know none of us are good. None of us meet God's standard. But if we believe in Jesus Christ, if we put our faith and our trust in Him, we are made good by accepting him into our lives. Danica McKellar is an American actress who got her start in the show The Wonder Years. Some of you may remember that show. Um, some of you are probably wondering what show is that, but 
go to YouTube. Uh, she was raised in California, mostly L.A. Uh, her parents raised her to be cautious of religion due to the fact that so many conflicts and wars were started by religions uh, in history. And so she would have considered herself a spiritual person, and she thought, you know, yeah, there's probably something beyond herself, but she didn't know what that was. When Danica was around 20 years old, um, her father had discovered Jesus and, and gave his life to Christ. Uh, he became born again, and he, and he shared his newfound faith with his family. He gave Danica a cross pendant to wear, and, uh, and she would wear it for him. Uh, especially whenever she left home, if he was coming to visit, she would wear it to show him that she had it on, but Christianity didn't make any sense to her. During her college years, she, she had a boyfriend who was an alcoholic, and uh, she ended up going to Al-Anon meetings, if you've ever heard of that organization. That uh, in, works in conjunction with AA. AA is for the addict, Al-Anon's for the family members uh, to find hope and help. And uh, she heard more about God there in that setting. Um, and so she would credit the universe, you know, as, you know, well, the universe has given me good things or whatever. But she was finally able to say at that point, well, okay, there's a God. There, there must be a God. But, but faith still eluded her. Um, she continued living her life, and she was married twice and had a son with her first husband and raising, raising her son. But something changed when she reached her 40s. Uh, as many of you know, she, she had done many Hallmark movies and a lot of Christmas Hallmark movies, so I, I, uh, I love watching those. Um, and it was there, working with Hallmark, that she became friends with Candace Cameron Bure. And in December of 2021, they began a conversation uh, that started around forgiveness. Um, Candace had tweeted something or put something on Instagram about forgiveness. And, and so Danica really wanted to know what she meant. She wanted to understand that. And so... Here they started this conversation, and, and through that, Candace ended up sending Danica a Bible, but she didn't start reading it right away. Um, and Candace also began inviting her to church, um, to where she would attend. Uh, and so from December till, I guess, spring of 2022, it just it never worked out. They just couldn't connect. And so Danica's very first Sunday was Palm Sunday that she went to church with Candace. And apparently in the worship service, they were performing a passion play. And Danica was there, and it was in that moment that she finally understood who Jesus was and, and what he came to do. And she, she basically says it all clicked for her. It all made sense. She... She ended up through that service, following the service, she basically said to Candace, what do I do? How, how do I do this? You know, and ended up, with Candace's help, giving her life to Christ. She felt that everything she had heard over her adult life in church and Al-Anon finally came together in this moment. And she turned her life over to Jesus. So if we want to remove the veils from our lives, we need to recognize freedom, true freedom, really only comes through Jesus. If we want our lives to change, it's, it's not about following a list of things so that I don't do them, do that behavior anymore. I mean, some of that may be necessary uh, in the long run, but it, but it starts really, it starts with letting God do the changing in us. It starts with saying, God, you know what? I need your help. I, I need you. 
you know, if I'm, if I'm trapped by addiction or sin, then it starts with giving God control of my life and realizing that I cannot find true freedom without Him. If I'm looking for answers, if I'm, if I'm trying to figure out how this world works, then I need to be open to, to finding them and, and letting the Holy Spirit be my guide. And I have to recognize, you know what? I'm not good. I'm not really good without God at work in my life. If Christ has removed our veil, we can obtain and become a reflection of the glory of God. Moses had to climb a mountain in order to be in God's presence, and the reflection of God's glory was only temporary. But we who have surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ are now the residents of God. And we are reflecting His everlasting glory in different ways in how we live. It's important that we live in submission to the authority of God. It's only by depending on the power of God to to live obediently, that our lives will truly reflect Him. As our lives reflect His presence and His power, we have the assurance of knowing God is at work changing us from the inside out. Together, as the church, we are being transformed into the image of Christ. This is one of the ways that we display the glory of God, our our, our corporate worship, coming together, supporting one another, celebrating together, even lamenting or mourning together. And as part of worship, we we have elements within that, that we do together to tell others that we belong to Jesus. So this morning, we're going to participate in communion together so that we can show others that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He's Lord over us, that He's Lord of our lives, and that He's Lord of our church. So if Christ isn't in charge of your life this morning, I want you to take the opportunity to say yes to Him. Make this communion the very first time that you say yes, Jesus is Lord, especially for those of you that are watching. Um, we're going to have communion together. If, if you want to, I apologize for not mentioning this earlier, if you want to run and grab some bread and juice or a cracker and juice or something, even water, doesn't matter, we're going to celebrate communion together as the family of God. Uh, hopefully everybody has... Uh, Juice has their little cup of wafer and juice. Um, I'm going to start us off here. If you don't, uh, they should be at the very back there if you need one. Um, does everyone have one? We're all good? Okay. Let me, uh, let me start by reading the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament which proclaims His his life, His sufferings, His sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of His coming again. It shows forth the Lord's death until His return. The supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. It's to be received in in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. All those who are truly repentant, so basically seeking forgiveness, forsaking their sins, and believing in Christ for salvation, are invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. We come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and be made one by the Holy Spirit. 
In unity with the church, we confess our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And so we pray. Father God, we we gather here this morning at your table in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who by your Spirit was anointed to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and set at liberty, to set free those who are oppressed. Christ healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He ate with sinners and established the new covenant for forgiveness of sins. We live in the hope of his coming again. On the night which he was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from it all of you. This is my body, or this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for you, for many for the forgiveness of sins, do this in remembrance of me. And so we gather as the body of Christ, Lord, to offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. Holy Holy Spirit, pour yourself out on us and on these your gifts. Make them by the power of your Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry of Christ to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The wafer represents Christ's body, broken, destroyed on the cross. Eat and remember his sacrifice for you and be thankful. Always a challenge to open these things. <laughs> the juice represents his blood that was shed on the cross for our sin. Remember, drink, and be thankful. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord God, thank you. Uh, for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of transformation. Thank you that we don't have to be trapped by our sin. We don't have to be trapped by addiction. We don't have to be trapped uh, by past hurts, that, that we can give that all over to you, that we can give it to you and Find life once again. Find freedom, <laughs> true freedom. And Lord, I know, I know some struggle with that. Some struggle and, and think, oh, gee, this, this, this is too easy. It's a crutch. But, but we know what the step is probably, the first step is probably the hardest that we can make. And so, Lord... If there are some that are here or are watching online, God, that, that need to take that step of freedom, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will nudge them, that you will continue to prompt them, and that you will let them know they are not alone in this. And if they need to call somebody, if they need to talk to somebody about helping them take that step, I pray, Lord, you will bring someone to mind. Bring, bring someone to their minds that say, listen, call them. They can help. Lord God, I am so grateful for the gift of freedom, from the gift of grace. Thank you for your love, holy God, that, God, you can help us be good in your eyes. 
Lord, there are so many that are trying to do it all on their own. So many that are just thinking, they're just getting by, and they're thinking, oh, I'm doing all right. But the reality is none of us are good without you, without your love, without your grace, without Jesus being in our lives. And so I, I pray, Lord, we would be able to take that message out today, out this week, that we could be your messengers declaring the goodness of God, the freedom found in God, and the joy in living for God. Continue to be with us in these moments of worship, Lord. Bless each one here, I pray in Jesus' name.